We're going to talk about network flows. And I don't want this video to be an exhaustive resource for this. It's just going to be um, carrying the intuition to you of kind of the roadblocks that I had to understanding this concept so that you can understand this as well. We have a graph here, and this is called a flow network. And all it is is a directed graph, which you can also call a die graph, which is a set of vertices, a set of edges. So there's a set of vertices, a set of edges, and every one of these edges indicates a capacity. We're going to denote that as C of E, the capacity of the eth edge or edge E. Every single edge has a capacity C sub E, and we have a start vertex, which is a vertex with in degree zero, and we have a sink T. And a sink just means that it's a vertex with no outward going edges. So it's out degree is zero. And so what flow networks are all about is that each one of these edges are kind of like pipes. And what our goal is, is to drive as much water through these pipes as possible. And these are just properties about the graph. It has each edge represents a capacity. We have a start. Water is going to be created from the start. And the sink T, this is where the water is going to want to end up. So I think the best way to visualize this is imagine these are pipes instead of edges. And this is the confusing thing. If you see it this way, it's more confusing when we get to the next part I'm going to show you. But let me revisualize this for you. Okay, so this is kind of the visualization we should have in our heads when we see this network. Right now, there's no flow going through the network. And flow is just this conceptual unit quantity where we're gonna try to push it. Let's just, we'll imagine it as water. These pipes have a certain capacity and we cannot push more than the capacity of a pipe at any single moment in time. And that means the maximum that we can ever push out of the start is going to be the sum of the capacities coming out of the start. If we're able to push all of the flow out of the start, then we've reached the maximum flow that we can even generate. So if I filled up this pipe two going outwards and I fill up this one, then that's three. There's more restrictions on what we can do here. So each edge is going to have a certain amount of flow going through it. It's going to, we can denote that as F of E. And so the amount of flow going through a certain edge, it can't be less than zero and it can't be greater than the capacity of the edge. So that's what restricts the amount of flow that we can push through any given edge. And we haven't pushed any flow through this flow network yet. So we're going to get to that part, but we're just imposing some restrictions on what this is going to look like for us. And so the value of a flow, uh, we'll denote that as V of F. So the value of this flow that we're going to create is going to be the amount of flow that we can get to come out of the start vertex. And we can see that the max it can ever be is three because we'll have two coming out here, one coming out there. And then if we put out any more, we're going to break the pipes. So now this is just going to be three. That's the sum of all of the edge capacities coming out of the start. And we'll denote it like that. So in this case, it's, it's, going, it's going to be three uh, at the end of this once we're done pushing flow through, but it's going to be the, we say F out of S, but in this case, we're just summing the amount of flow we're gonna push through the edge capacities. But in, not in every case will we be able to push as much water as we want. So in certain networks, we're going to be limited, and that's going to bring us to max flow min cut. Our max flow that we can push out of the start will be limited by the minimum cut that we can find in this flow network, and we'll get to that. But for now, we're just trying to find an optimal flow, and then we're gonna draw that relationship later. So we're going to get rid of this. And so now what we can do is we can just eyeball this and decide what to do. So we have a capacity of two, capacity of one. We see these guys are pointing that way. This three is pointing down. We have that one pointing that way, that two pointing that way. Why don't we take a greedy approach? We could just push as much capacity out of the largest um, edge coming off of the start. So we can push two flow out. But now that we've pushed two flow out, we have two uh, of this conceptual quantity of flow at the U. There's another thing where we have to conserve flow. So if two units of, of this water goes into U, two units has to leave you as well. So we could be greedy again. We could push it through this three edge as much flow as possible out of here. So we can go this way. Okay, so what you just saw was we just pushed two units of water down this way. So now U is happy. Two units of water are coming out of it. What we're actually doing is we're following a path to T. Finally, reroute this water all the way. We fill this final pipe. And so this is it. What is the value of our flow? The, the answer to that question is how much flow is coming out of the start? You see that the value of our flow is two. But the issue here is, have we maximized that value? Have we maximized the water that we can push through this flow network? And the answer is no, we haven't maximized it. And the reason is there's still one unit of water left here. Now we need to reassess what we're doing. 
we are, are limited here. If I push one unit of water this way, where can that water go? The water can't go up because this edge is coming down here. It, water can only flow down. And then we're, this pipe is full going this way. We can't break this edge, this pipe will explode. So we're stuck here. And the key realization we can make is, how much flow is going through here? Two. How much flow is going through here? Two. What happens if we backed off a bit here? What happens if we erase some of the flow going through here? We just push one unit through this pipe. Remember, this pipe's capacity is three. Well, if we just push one unit of flow here, by conservation, we still have to push one unit out of U, and V has too much coming out of it. Only one unit's coming to V, so let's fix V, the VT edge. Okay, so now do you see what's happening? Now we fix the VT edge. So now we said U, you have two units of flow. Before we were pushing all two units, so it was great. We got U's equilibrium, we got U to equilibrium. But now we have one unit of flow still left to push out of U. And which way could that go? It can go this way. And now U is back to equilibrium. So now, this, are, are we seeing what's going on here? The greedy approach gave us a dead end and we couldn't get this last unit of flow out. But now we realize if we back off on how much flow goes through here, this U is still happy. It got rid of the two units coming into it. It got out one this way, one that way. And then V said, okay, now I have one unit coming my way. Where, how do I get rid of it? I go towards the T. But now, how do we maximize our flow? We can push one unit of flow through the SV edge. And now V has one unit of flow to get rid of because we just push one unit that way. And now V needs to push it finally to T. So this is the optimized flow network. And why do we know that? Well, what is the value of this flow? We're pushing out three units of flow from the start. And as, as a uh, symmetrical statement, we can say we're getting three units of flow to the end. And so the value is now three. And we know that this is the maximum amount of water that we can create and push through this flow network because this is the maximum that the, starts, the starting genesis edges can actually fit. We only can ever create at maximum three units coming out of these start edges, or else we would break the, the very beginning edges. So no more flow can be pushed through this network and we're complete. We've reached the maximum flow. So now that we've demonstrated how the greedy approach makes us get stuck, and there's actually more optimal ways to push flow through this flow network, we need to think about a way to systematize this. And this is going to bring us to the ford fulkerson algorithm, um, which is the algorithm we're about to do to create a generic way to always find the optimal flow in a flow network. And again, if you wanna see proofs for all of this, there's great textbooks to reference, I'll link them below. We're not going to get into any of the deep proofs, but we're going to go over the overarching intuitions. Before we get to the ford fulkerson algorithm, we need to lay a definition. And it's something called a residual graph. And all this is is, it's not different from anything we were just doing. That's why I wanted to lay down that intuition base, right? What we had before is the original. So this is the original. That's the original flow network. And each of these are capacities. All of the pipes are empty. There's no flow. There's no water going through this network. That's how I want you to think about this. And now we're going to try to push water through this. That's what we want to do. That's our desire is push as much water out of this start and through the network successfully to the sink vertex. Push as much water as possible. What the residual graph is going to show us is it's going to uh, precisely show us where can we undo flow and when can, when can we push more flow. And based on these two things, we're going to be able to optimize how much flow we can push through our network. So now, let's go back to what our greedy approach did. When we pushed two units of flow, what happened? We, we, we would push it along a certain path. The path was SUVT. So this is what our greedy algorithm said. It said, push as much flow as possible from the largest edge, and then just find its way to the end. So now, we push two units of flow from S to U, and that's our path for every one of the edges on that path, and we have three edges, one, two, three, on that path, we're going to show what the residual would look like. So if I push one unit of flow this way, this is what the residual would look like. So just follow me on this. So why did we just do that? This is saying, there was a flow quantity pushed from S to U, we can undo that by two. This means that there are two units of flow at U. Which way can they go if we wanted to undo that action? We could push two units back. Now that there are two units of flow at U, we need to push that through this, through this residual graph. But this is going over an edge with value three. So if we push two units over this three edge, we can undo two. This is saying from U to V, push two units of flow. Now there's two units of V, 
that means we can undo two units of flow, push it back to you. Well, we won't push it back. We can just undo how much we're pushing from you. That's what that's symbolizing. But there's still more that can go through this edge. Its capacity is three. So we actually can push one more unit of flow. So the forward edges are going to symbolize, hey, can I push more flow over this edge? Yes, because it's three, we only push two. The backwards edges, the edges pointing into this vertex U are saying, we pushed that much from this vertex to the other. We pushed two from U to V. That means we can, we can lessen, up, lessen up on how much we were pushing before. And now there's two units of flow sitting here if we're still staying with what we were doing. So now that needs to go over the capacity two pipe. And this is why I said, we wanna start with the conceptualization as pipes because if you see these edges and we immediately jump to more edges, it's very confusing what's happening. Just remember, these are capacities. They're not actually, um, they're different from what's going on from here. These are just capacities. So this is two. If we push two units of flow across, now the residual graph is going to tell us we push two units from V to T. I can back off by two units. I can back off how much flow I'm pushing out, but then I'm going to have to put it somewhere else. By conservation, that flow has to go somewhere. But in this case, it's just saying, hey, if you wanna undo some flow you did here, you can do that, but you'll have to find another way to redirect it. So now all the other edges stay the same. So here's probably, here, this is why this is so important, and this is possibly the most confusing part, at least it was for me. This residual graph is giving us a lot of information. It's saying, there's still one unit of flow I can pass from S to V. And notice, there's actually a path in this residual graph. Let's call it P prime. It goes S, V, jumps from V to U, that's confusing, and then v, U to T. So this is really confusing, because if we look at our original graph, you're not allowed to go from V to U. That's, that's not allowed. The edge goes downwards, right? But actually, what our residual graph is really telling us is, I can push one unit from S to V. That's pretty obvious, right? There's still one unit of, this, this edge has one capacity, I can push it. But here's the biggest realization we can make. There's two units of flow we can undo and we can drain back into U. But what happens? I have to get rid of it. But because we found a path, because P prime is a path in the residual graph, I know for a fact there is a way to redirect that flow to get it to the end in a way that creates more space or allows us to increase the value of our flow. So what happens is, remember how you saw we kicked back one unit of flow back into you and redirected it. Our residual graph is literally telling us, let me push one unit this way, and then let me pull back one unit here, and then I'll push one unit that way. So what our residual graph is telling us, it's not directly telling us which way the flow goes, it's telling us which, which edges are critical to look at if we want to maximize the flow. That's what it's telling us. And, and this is actually the basis of the ford fulkerson algorithm. This brings us to following the residual path. This is the next jump I want you to make. We were at the original graph, we were dealing with capacities there, but this is the next large jump. What we can do here is we can push one unit of flow this way, so this edge goes backwards. We're following that SV path. So we finish this edge, we finish the SV edge, but now the UV edge. So the UV edge needs to be dealt with. So what is this telling us? If we just pushed one unit of flow this way and we wanna follow the path through the residual graph to optimize the global flow, this edge going forward is not saying, it's not saying push V to U, it's not saying that. It's saying undo one unit of flow. And if I undo one unit of flow, what, is, what do the new arrows become? The new arrows become this, right? They become this because now, how much, how much can we undo going from U to V? We can undo one unit of flow because we only pushed one, we, we, we pulled back a bit at U, but now U needs to get rid of one more unit of flow. We're following the P prime path. Here's our final edge. And this is not saying the flow goes this way, it's just optimizing the, the actual max flow we were trying to achieve before, Fall by, by augmenting paths that can push flow and pulling back on edges that can pull back flow and redirect. But now we're at the U, now we can redirect that one unit of flow this way and so this residual graph, if we look at it, is actually telling us the value of the flow. We're saying, I can undo two going out of the start. I can undo two and then one. That's a total of three. So the value of the flow is three. And so this brings us over here. The, we see that we were able to get three units of flow into the sink T. 
So that's, that's a symmetric statement to what we were saying there. Because if we got it out of here and got it there, in the first place, we would never pushed flow if there wasn't an ST path in the residual graph. We would have never adjusted the flow we were pushing. So now that we saw the original graph, and then after that, we saw what it meant to push flow, and then we saw the greedy approach, and now we saw the residual graph, which gives us a more intelligent way to bring back flow and redirect it. We're not going to actually get into the proof of why this generates an optimal flow every time, but we're going to get into the overarching pseudocode of the ford fulkerson algorithm, and then from there you can draw your own generalizations. And now that you have this intuition underneath, everything else should be a bit more straightforward to grasp. So as a high-level overview, the ford fulkerson algorithm is going to start every single edge, start the flow going every single edge as zero. No flow will traverse any edge, not the start, not the end, not any edges in the middle. So that says, the flow for every single edge, every single edge that's an element of the edges is going to be zero. And so next, now that the flow is zero, we're starting with all empty pipes like before, exactly what we were doing before. Next, we want to continue to push flow through the residual graph, and we won't get into proving why this actually works, but push flow through the residual graph while we saw there was an ST path in the residual graph that indicated a smarter way to redirect flow. So while a path exists from S to T in G prime, or the residual graph, we're going to push flow. So this is a while loop. We're going to extract a path, and we can do this with breadth first search and big O V plus E time. We're going to extract a path. Then we're going to try to push flow through that. So we're going to pull that path out into a variable P, follow this path in the residual graph, and we're going to augment this path. It's, we will call it augmenting. And so while we're doing this, we're going to be updating the original graph, G. And then after all of this is over, we're going to want to update the, uh, the flow value, the actual number value of the flow. And we're going to want to update the residual graph to reflect the new um, meta information about where flow is going in the graph. And so that is kind of the overarching view. The residual graph is giving us critical information about what to do in the original graph's flow. And then once we operate on the original graph along that path, then we're going to have a more optimized flow and we're going to update the residual graph at the final step. So next iteration, our residual graph is fresh so that we can see, is there another path where we can improve the flow in the original graph? So now we're going to talk about max flows and min cuts. And I'm not going to go too deep into this. All of the proofs, all of the really um, definition heavy stuff, I'll leave to the textbook, but we're going to get into that very quickly. So basically what the max flow min cut theorem states is that we, we want to take an ST cut. So what is a cut? A cut is a partitioning of the vertices into two disjoint subsets. So what does that mean? That means that the union, the union of these two partitions we take is going to be the original set of vertices. But the intersection, the intersection is the empty set. And that is what a cut is going to do. It'll literally cut the graph along a certain line. So think of it like that. That's a cut. The A has S, B has U, T, and V. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the capacity. We're trying to find the capacity of the edges crossing this partition. So let's imagine this. If we take a cut like this, and I'm gonna keep the edges out of the picture just so you see that this is literally a cut of the vertices. What are the edges crossing the cut? So if we see the original graph, we see U, T, we see UV, and then we also see SV. So the, the capacity, the max flow that could be pushed across the cut is going to be three plus two plus one, which is going to be six. So that is the capacity of a cut. We're interested in the smallest capacity cut. The smallest capacity cut will dictate the maximum flow that we can achieve in the flow network. So this is actually what we were doing before. Remember when I said, the amount of capacity coming out of the start, in this case seven, gives us an upper bound on the flow we can create. But is, the, is it the tightest upper bound? What the min flow max cut theorem wants to do is, it wants to get that upper bound as tight as possible, because if we can get that upper bound to the min cut, then we know the maximum flow we can achieve without even doing anything, as long as we can find cuts and find the min cut. So what is the min cut in this case? So if we look at this, what is the minimum cut? So if we take the cut here, we see that there's a capacity of seven crossing it. So we'll, we'll take note of that. If we take the cut here 
And I'm sorry, this is an ST cut. So S has to be an A and T has to be in B. This is called an ST cut. So ST, ST cut. So S has to be in one partition, T has to be in the other. And S is gonna be in A, T is gonna be in B. What is the capacity crossing this? We see there's an edge three, three, two, and one. So the capacity of this cut is six. Now we bested seven, we bested seven. Now the new upper bound on the flow that we can push is six. And next, let's take another cut. So we're going to take that. So this is also an ST cut. So what, who is crossing the cut? We see four. And we're only counting edges going out of the cut, going outwards. We have four and three, so seven. This does not improve our upper bound, so let's keep taking cuts. So now, what, it, what are the edges crossing this cut? We see that there's two edges that sum up to four, and they beat our new upper bound. Our new upper bound is four. And what we actually just found is the cut that is minimum. The whole thing that we were saying, max flow, min cut, what that actually means is the capacity of the minimum cut, which is four, is going to be the maximum flow if we do the ford fulkerson algorithm, the maximum flow we can achieve given these capacities. So the max flow is also four. So that's exactly what max flow min cut is saying. The max flow is equivalent to the minimum cut, which is the minimum capacity cut where we look at the edges crossing the cut in the forwards direction. There's a lot going behind the scenes as to saying why this is true, but we're not going to get into that. The text, textbooks can do 10 times more justice than I could ever do in a video, but I just wanted to explain the intuition behind this. And um, now that you understand this, you have a lot better pre-context to go and read about this. So this is um, Max Flow Min Cut, Flow Networks, and the Ford Fulkerson algorithm.